musician, religious teacher, and an author. Mm -hmm. So I like to start with the religious thing because sure. it makes things clearer. I yes, think. I think because it's it's probably worth explaining that my books and my music always have a spiritual hintergrund. So, yeah, without understanding my spiritual uh, approach to life, then my art doesn't make sense. So uh, you grew up in the uh, 1960s, mm -hmm. let's call it hippie environment. Can you tell us something about this time and how you grew up? I, yeah, I think to understand my work, it's probably very important to place it in context that I grew up in the Sechziger Jahr in America, a very nomadic, bohemian existence. Um, my father was a little older than the hippie generation. He was a former Navy officer who became a beatnik, you know, in the Funziger Jahr. And then when the psychedelic revolution started, he became very involved in the whole psychedelic experimentation and free love and, you know, all, all of the liberation movements of the 60s is what I grew up with. Also, my parents, one of the many things they did was promoting jazz and pop music of the time. So musically, the first time I ever sang in a microphone was the lead singer of Herman's Hermits. Peter Noon let me use the microphone when I was a very little child. So I was immediately exposed to, you know, entertainment and performance as, as a normal everyday part of my life. But I think the important thing as far as it goes to my work is that many people attracted to my music or my writing, they come from dysfunctional families, unhappy families, and they're looking for an alternative. They are rebelling against something. And I was brought up by rebels, so in a way, it's there's a little bit of a abstand. So I, I, I already was brought up to believe that revolution is good, that being counterculture is good, that being anti-establishment is a positive value. So I never had to rebel against my parents in the way that many people attracted to whatever genre of music I'm supposed to do. do. And when your parents were part of this counterculture, did they have any uh, religious beliefs? Typically uh, no, testing a lot? No, act actually in a typical way of people from who were brought up in the 50s, 40s, they They rejected organized religion, but they allowed me complete freedom. So in the 1960s, during the occult Wiederkehr that happened, the occult renaissance in America and Europe, I was immediately attracted to the devil and to Teufel's Anbetung, and they never had any problem with it. In Gegenteil, they, whatever, you know, it, they, they really believed a child should be allowed freedom to do whatever they wanted, so I was encouraged. Because and They were not afraid that you'd do something, harm yourself? Or never, harm. never. And so, it, why maybe that will help people understand my work, I was raised in a very strange alternative universe. So if I had an interest in the devil or occultism or even controversial things because my father was a military historian and a bohemian, if I looked into the Third Reich, it was just another subject matter. There were, I was never taught this is verboten and this is good and this is evil. I was taught you can look at anything with a free mind. But your uh, parents, if you uh, you could go to them and ask them how is this man or so, and they explained as parents do. Yes, yes. So, but but the important thing is they were in a very typical anti-establishment way. They were against organized religion, but. My father, because he experimented with psychedelics in that early period when they were considered to be a kind of utopian idea for liberating humanity, he was very interested in Bewusstsein and consciousness raising. So he understood the concept of magic and the concept that there is much more to the mind than, you know, than the normal Alltägliche Leute glauben. So, so he encouraged me in that way, in a philosophical way. I can imagine that it had been some kind of difficulty with other children to be together. It was like the Adams family. In a way, I was very naive because I didn't know what the normal society was like. 
So, zum Beispiel, I went to school wearing black clothing in the 60s and 70s, and that was just unheard of. There was no subculture like that. I was just attracted to the, the aesthetic of everything satanic and devilish, but in an innocent way, without knowing that it is considered hateful or horrible. So what would always happen, my teachers would give me house aufgabe or, or homework, and, you know, write, write about something. So I would write about Jack the Ripper or, or, you know, summoning demons. And then they would call my parents to school and say, well, do you know your son is doing this strange thing? And my parents would say, yeah, that's fine. So, <laughs> so yes, it, it wasn't a problem, but it, was, it created a uh, cognitive dissonance. Can you tell us about the stations of your spiritual way? You say you were very early attracted to Satanism. Mm -hmm. The first spiritual experience that I can remember, I would say, put me more in the direction of Heidentum, an antique Griechische und Nordische Heidentum. When I was really nearly an infant, my parents had a statue of the Venus de Milo, typische cliché tourist statue from the Louvre in Paris. And I was fascinated with the statue, and I felt that it communicated with me. So my first spiritual erfarung was a feeling that the goddess Venus was a living being and communicating with me. So very early on, I was fascinated with Greek mythology and Nordic mythology in particular. And I was just obsessed with them as a child, so I, I studied everything I could about the myths and sagas of the Greek and northern gods. And in a way, the Wurzeln of the radio werewolf work goes back to this very early childhood study of Odin, Freya, the Fenris wolf, Loki, the dark side of the Nordic pantheon. We're seven or eight. Something like that. And so I was more interested in the ancient world than in the current, in the Zeitgenossische world. It interested me gar nicht. I only wanted to know about the sagas and the Helden of Greece. So that was the first phase. Then in the mid-60s, probably even earlier, around 65 or 66, I had a babysitter who was kind of a counterculture type too, and she considered herself a hexa, a witch. And she kind of was my first initiatrix. She As is very true in most of my life, females are who have guided me onto the spiritual path. That's part of what the left-hand path is about, is that, is that the female wisdom guides you. This basically teenage witch babysitter had a very positive ideas about Satanism and devil worship, and she taught me the basics of it, you know, in a very childish, primitive way. And again, I was given a positive feeling that the devil is something good and heroic and liberatory, Never, not, not evil. And I saw it from that point of view, from the biblical point of view of the story of Jesus meeting the devil in the desert and the devil offers him the world if he will follow him. And so that, that was my original concept of what the devil is, but that's how far back it goes. And then in the culture of America at the time, there was this sudden, because of all these books about witchcraft and all of the hippie experimentation with alternative religion and occultism, there was devil symbolism and devil literature and devil music everywhere. Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. Kenneth Anger. Kenneth Anger, the Manson murders, which were then promoted as some sort of Teuflische, Mord cult. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand that in that time, the popular culture was imbued with diabolism. It was everywhere. So that had a great effect on me. So you mentioned an um, lightning experience in Egypt? Yes, yes. The next phase was that in London, in the early Oxiger year, I was there during this uh, another magical revival, the period of all this chaos magic and all that kind of Choral thing. Soskias, yes, people. and mm -hmm. and I was not very beeindruckt by it. It seemed very 
oberflächlich and, yeah. and whole and, and not authentic, not like connected to any deep tradition. And through the work of Kenneth Grant, who was involved with the Typhonian OTO, he's a rather obscure English writer that Germans may not know of very much, I, I became introduced to the concept of set, the, Egypt, the alt egyptische Scott set. And I did a lot of Forschung about Set research on the identity of him. And again, I, my whole life has been a series of obsessions, urgent obsessions that I follow and look into. And then I felt that to really understand what Set is, I had to go to Egypt. And I had no money whatsoever. I was very young and, you know, 19 minutes. 20, 20, 21, 21, I think. And I went to Egypt and went to, you know, all of the magical sites of the ancient Egyptian religion, and there had a visionary experience which convinced me that Set is an existing being, an intelligence that can communicate with Menschheit, with humanity. That was the first experience that absolutely überzeugt mich, dass the Gottliche Wesen existieren, the gods exist. In, in what form? You felt like a communication. I had a definite communication, and I felt that I was given like befail, like, mm -hmm. like orders, a command from Set. And what my idea at that time, I had left America because there was this right-wing Christian fundamentalist Ronald Reagan period, and I thought, I have to escape America, it's doomed. Mm -hmm. Which it turned out it, is, it was doomed. <laughs> Now, why it's crazy to think going to Egypt, an Islamic <laughs> dictatorship, is better, but, you know, I was young, and that was, that was this romantic idea that I was escaping to the ancient past. So I wanted to settle in Egypt and retire from the world and only concentrate on magic, meditation. But what I felt happened to me in Egypt was that Set gave me this botschaft, that no, that is, that's to be a faiga, a coward. If you leave, you should go back and fight. When I say fight this Christian thing, I mean fight this right-wing fundamentalist mm. Christian perversion of the Christian religion and bring the ancient gods back to the feindliche Gebiet, so, so to speak. And also that is what inspired me to use music because I, I had part of this experience was hearing sound as a way to change your consciousness. That music is not just Unterhaltung, but that it is actually a very deep way to change consciousness. And that by creating certain sounds and frequencies, it goes deeper into changing people's minds than words or linear rational communication. That's what you stated in the, in the booklet of the first... Right. So that was a direct influence on, on using music as my main magical tool and my main spiritual form of communication. If you want to continue chronologically, in about 2002, we formally converted to Tantric Buddhism, to Vajrayana Buddhism, or what is known as Tibetisha Buddhism in the West. I have always meditated, even since my adolescence, but since converting to Tantric Buddhism, I am certain that is the end of my very long spiritual search, which has taken me from Greek and Nordic paganism through Egyptian magic, devil worship, and... But ultimately, it's all part of the same spiritual search for what was is Wahrheit, was ist Realität. You said you converted to the Tantric Buddhism. The Tantric, or as we, as it's called here, Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about the main concepts of that? Well, it's in, it's very complicated, but the maybe the most important concept to understand is that this reality that we are living in is an illusion that it is a kind of hallucination. It's a niveau of Bewusstsein, the ein Traum. Like, it's a dreamlike state of consciousness. It is not the ultimate reality. And what, what Buddhism means, the word Buddha, 
or Buddhist in Sanskrit means to erwachen, to awaken. So the point of Buddhism ultimately and of Vajrayana Buddhism but of all schools of Buddhism is to awaken from this dreamlike state of illusion that we have fallen into. So that is the ultimate goal, to understand the nature of reality, what the, what the Buddha's first teaching was, is that you must learn to meditate, you must learn to calm the craziness of your mental process, all of these discursive thinking, the way that our, our mind carries us away in the thought process, the first thing that's important to communicate is that you must learn to meditate and you must understand the nature of your mind because this reality that we're experiencing is your mind and if you make your mind calm and tranquil like we're, we're sitting near a lake right now and if you look into the lake because the water is moving it's difficult to see what's underneath it and our mind is like that. When, when our thoughts are going very quickly, we can't see what is this mind. So the first, maybe the most important thing to understand about Buddhism is the necessity of calming the mind, meditating, so that we can see the nature of reality properly. And then, through meditation, one can learn how to escape from this hallucinatory state of illusion that we are in. So that, that is on a very simple level, perhaps well, the essence. What happens if you are woken? So can you still handle the life as it is or it makes it easier? Yes, it makes it easier, but you, it's, it would be exactly like if you know what lucid dreaming mm -hmm. is. You can have a dream within a dream and you can awaken and realize in your sleep, I am dreaming. It is possible in this life to awaken from this dream we're in and yet realize this is all an illusion and a dream. And then yes, everything becomes easier to deal with because you see the true nature of it and you start not to take it so seriously and you start not to get so involved in all of the dramas of it. And then, and then this slowly leads to the process of what is called liberation, which means liberation from the suffering of being in this physical realm and ultimately to end the process of what is known in the West as reincarnation of Wiedergeburt, which in Buddhism is a problem. It's a problem that we keep being Wiedergeboren. We want to end the cycle of rebirth. But there's only uh, a goal for a single person, for a single individual, there's no complex goal for all the No, uh, actually the thing that uh, the Merkmal of Tantrasha Buddhism is that you free yourself so that you can free everybody, so that you can ultimately free all beings. That includes animals, demons, ghosts, gods, humans. So the point is to develop mitleid for all beings, every single being, including your enemies, including Ona Ausnama to have compassion for all yeah. beings and to help free them. So, Otherwise it was a bit too egocentric for me if you just care only about yourself. Yes, well that, that is the difference between what is called Hinayana Buddhism, yeah. which is practiced in countries like Sri Lanka. That is only about liberation for yourself. Tantric Buddhism, the Bodhisattva concept, is that it's like if you were a Gifanganer in a prison if you found the way out of the prison, it's your, your Verantwortlichkeit to help the other prisoners get out. And, the, and so Tantric Buddhism is trying to free all beings. And that's your, your task as a teacher to free others, help if, them if to free they, themselves? Yes. I can't free somebody else, but I can give them the methods which the Buddha has passed yeah. on through this lineage for thousands of years, these very bestimmt, specific methods that work. Not a theory, not, mm -hmm. not a idea, but actual praxis that if you do it, it works and it frees you of this illusion. It, it slowly wakes you up and then you can learn to free yourself.
Meditation is the, the Grundstein of all Buddhisms. But there are many, many methods. Uh, for instance, the Buddha is said to have taught 84,000 techniques because there are so many different mm -hmm. kinds of people. Okay. And the Buddha taught whatever anyone needs. Is He came up with a method to help free them. But I, when in saying these things, I always feel it's necessary to say I'm not... People often think because I am very firm in my convictions that I'm telling other people they should go that way or that they should believe it. You know, that's a private concern. So if people are interested in my spiritual practice, that's fine and I'm happy to talk about it, but it doesn't, everyone should find their own spiritual direction. So what's your experience as a, a spiritual teacher here? Do people expect something else? Well, people come to the spiritual teacher-student relationship with all kinds of evortum and expectations. And it's very hard work because basically it's I'm giving the student methods to sit alone and look at their own mind and understand who they are to see reality properly. So it, it, it requires a lot of discipline, a lot of geduld, a lot of time and a lot of energy. And you, you really have to be dedicated And you have to understand the dringend es ist liberation zu erreichen. You have to have a very strong motivation. Es kann nicht nur ein Freizeit, not like a hobby. So I choose my students very carefully. I don't. It has to be someone who is really serious and understands that this is something that is going to take a lot of hard work. Part two. Radio Werewolf. Uh, Radio Werewolf, to turn to the music, sure. is a spiritual outfit as well. Mm -hmm. What was the original idea behind? Was there any plan? On I that? would say there there wasn't really a plan. I would, I would say the original Radio Werewolf that founded in 1984 in Los Angeles, it was really just like a artistic projection of where my mind was at that moment. But, of course, it, I did see it very much as a magical operation. The way that I conceived Radio Werewolf, at that time I was doing ceremonial magic in the traditional way, in a ritual chamber. And what I was doing was, with Radio Werewolf was doing magical rituals in public, use, using, using the format of popular music, almost in a manipulative way, to directly bring magical energies into popular culture. And and there was cert there was a degree also of self-parody, which I don't think that because of the extreme nature of what I was doing, I don't think people saw how much black humor and self-parody there was to it, of taking on these very extreme personas and ritual performances to, to embody everything that people hated or everything that people thought was evil and then to be that completely. And that comes from my theatrical background because I was trained in theater. So even my singing comes from a more musical theater background where one takes on a character and becomes that character. But because I did it in, in Deadly Ernst, people thought all of it was 100% serious and I, I think so my sense of humor I think is very often not understood in Radio Werewolf. There's a video uh, still on YouTube this is the uh, 1916 Cadillac horse mm -hmm. you're playing live on a bar mitzvah or so? Well the, that, that was uh, 1960 Cadillac Curse was sort of a homage to like the California car and Beach Boy songs mm -hmm. about cars It was the, the performance that's on YouTube, I don't think a lot of people understand. That was from a film called Mortuary Academy, which Radio Werewolf were hired to perform it. And of course, the, the comedic part of it was the script was written before the director of the film even knew about Radio Werewolf. And he had in the film that there's this evil band who is killed in a car accident and then brought back to life at this corrupt mortuary. And then they they do their reunion concert at a bar mitzvah. So that was so incredibly perfect for Radio Werewolf's image at the time. And so they hired us because we fit the fictional 
model of, of the characters. But that particular clip, we're supposed to have just been, we we're supposed to be dead, and we're like, we have been revived to life, like Frankenstein's monsters. This is a very humorous thing, and I can't understand that people don't see it. Well, they, people see what they want to see, yeah. that's what I've learned. There's the song Buried Alive on this American Gothic sample. Can you tell us something about the scene at this time? Buried Alive is an interesting song because that was a collaboration between James Collard, the original bass player of Radio Werewolf, and myself. That was the first song we wrote together. And in a way, that's probably become the most popular of the early Radio Werewolf songs because it was on this American Gothic sampler. The interesting thing, because I'm doing this interview with you here in Germany, is there was a club called The Crypt in Los Angeles, and for a while that became like the center of this very underground gothic scene though I never used the word gothic or mm. death rock and I always hated these categories and cliches that mm. we the Radio Werewolf opened that club and it was run by a German couple so it had a very Germanic uh, Teutonic feel this little underworld or subculture of the California gothic scene because this German couple ran it and When they put out this compilation, American Gothic, and had Buried Alive on it, it became very popular in Germany. So right from the beginning of Radio Werewolf, though it was a California phenomenon, it was very strange that we immediately reached a German audience. And it, and it led to many interviews with mainstream German magazines, so that long before I moved here, Radio Werewolf had a cult following in Germany because of Buried Alive and because of that sampler. And that eventually led to Gymnastic Records in Munich signing Radio Werewolf. Now the interesting thing, how things return in one's life, is now James Collard and I are working together again on our new project, Kingdom of Heaven. So in a way, Buried Alive was the beginning of Kingdom of Heaven, So we're, because we are collaborating again on new music. So let's switch to this gymnastics question. I remember that this label from one day to another really disappeared. Do you know what happened? Uh, I, I really don't know all the details. All I can say is that at the beginning, Gymnastic Records, which was run by Carl Erling in Munich, was dedicated to a wide selection of different mm -hmm. eclectic musical bands. And then eventually, I believe what happened is he founded Chrome Records, mm -hmm and just became exclusively the manager and promoter of Dinah Lekine, which was one of the bands. But I don't really know what happened to Gymnastic Records or why, it, why it's verschwindet so plötzlich. You were mentioning several times uh, Satanic Panic. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain to us what, what, what yeah, kind I, of Yeah, I think for, for, for a German audience, considering the fact that in Germany... Uh, and you coming from East Germany, it's impossible to imagine because, for instance, in East Germany, religion was practically verboten. There you had the government saying Christianity is a problem. <laughs> and in America, in the 80s, you had the Ronald Reagan Republican mm -hmm. government bringing back this very corrupt, perverted political version of fundamentalist Christianity that became almost like a state religion at that time. And it went completely against the original American idea of the separation of church and state. And suddenly, in the early 80s, after Ronald Reagan was elected, there was this right-wing political Christian witch hunt against any form of alternative religion. So it became like a Hexenjagd. Just as America always has had, first the Americans killed the Indians, then there was the Red Scare when they were terrified of communists, mm. then there was the Satanic Panic, as it was called, and now it's Islamic terrorists. Mm. And there's America must always have an enemy. And in the 80s, occultism and Satanism became the enemy. What it was, was that the right-wing Christian politicians needed a Sundenbuk, something to say, here is the enemy, here is the villain, 
here is the, the Erzfeind. And really, th they created an artificial panic by spreading all these insane rumors about child sacrifice. And, you know, very much today, though, in, in, in this era, the way that people believe in the Illuminati mm -hmm. conspiracy theory. And you look on the internet and see countless beliefs that the Illuminati is controlling everything. I think the Wurzeln of this was the satanic panic in the Oxiger Yar in America. So I think for Europeans it is inconceivable to imagine how primitive and fundamentalist the Christian, this kind of right-wing Christianity in America is, and how the political apparatus was using the police and the media to push this right-wing Christian agenda. Concerts were forbidden and... In, in terms of Radio Werewolf, almost like deliberately provocative and confrontative, when I began, as I said, I was somewhat naive, mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize that what I was doing was... Sh I mean, people often accuse me of being shocking for its own sake, but that's actually nothing that I've ever thought of. It's just, I was the way I was, and people reacted to it. But when it got this very strong reaction, because of this satanic panic, then I pushed it. And I found, if that bothers you, then I will push it further, and further, and further. And it was almost, it almost became like a game to see how far I can go. So then I deliberately played with these ideas of satanic music and satanic backward masking and mind control and did it ever become dangerous for you yes yes it did you see it was a, it was a game that became dangerous and i think that's not in germany it's hard to imagine that it would become dangerous it's just seen as a subculture or music but yes it got to the point of police harassment and concerts being actually canceled and being followed around and having people coming, you know, to my house to harass me. So yes, it became very dangerous to me. And then later when I married Zena, who was then the high priestess of the Church of Satan, she was almost single-handedly fighting this satanic panic because she was the only person going on national television to actually be a voice of reason fighting this outbreak of insanity. As uh, Radio Werewolf you released? Radio Werewolf released seven releases altogether. So I think six are well known to the fans. This free uh, 12 inches and yeah. the free albums. Right. But the first album is somehow lost. Yes, the, the first album to this day it's almost like a flucht. So about two years ago, I spoke to the other original members of Radio Werewolf and we agreed to put it out, and yet still it is not coming out because there, there continues to be whatever problematic energy. It's cursed. There, in fact, the whole Radio Werewolf experience was always very schwieriger. Everything was very difficult and everything led to a big drama and a crisis. I don't know that that first album will ever come out. People are always asking me about it, and I, I have sincerely tried to do it, but it remains to be seen if the original tapes can actually be restored. Well, they're, they're ready to go, but it's, it just remains part of the Radio Werewolf curse, so it's part, part of it, that it, maybe it's a hidden yeah. album. What uh, happened exactly at this time, why it was not released? Well, because... What happened is Evil Wilhelm, the trommler for Radio Werewolf, suddenly uh, decided to leave Radio Werewolf, and so the whole concept of it changed, and then the Fiery Summons was released, and I went into an, a different musical Richtung. And then it, it, it's like whatever is not released becomes a legend. So it's, it's like the Beach Boys Smile album. Okay. So it made no sense at the time to release it. It, we could have, but we, we had, at first, Evil Wilhelm and I, after he split, we had a very hostile relationship. We have since repaired our friendship and are on speaking terms again, but that's why the first album got lost in limbo for so long. So maybe in a hundred years it will finally be released, but I, I cannot promise. <laughs> Uh, you stopped releasing albums after the uh, songs from the end of the world? No, 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 after Love Conquers All. Love Conquers All, yes. Love Conquers All was, was deliberately the last album because that was the end 
of the Radio Werewolf Ritual. And if you listen to all the albums and the EPs and sequence, they form a cyclos. Radio Werewolf was never conceived as a band, it was a ritual. So a ritual begins and then it must be brought to an end. And then you see what the Ergebnis. You start with a fairy summons? Yeah. Lightning in the Sun, Lightning. Songs for the End of the World, Bring Me the Head of Geraldo Rivera, Witchcraft Boots, and Love Conquers All. And there, there is like a rotis faden through all of them. It, t it tells a narrative. It is like the beginning of a ritual and then the ending of the ritual. And of course, even though I am not the same person that did this Radio Werewolf ritual, the consequences, the nachal, the echo of the ritual continues to this day. We're, well, just last night at this festival, people were coming up to me who have been very beeinflussed by Radio Werewolf. Cool. So in a way, it, it has a life of its own, Radio Werewolf. It, it's still, even without me, even if I was dead, it still, it still lives. As you said, the cycle was abgeschlossen? Yeah. But the other side was uh, maybe too much business? Yes, yes, well... We, we always had the idea that we will end it, that we will not just go on forever as long as people buy it. It was always an idea that, that it is... Zena and I particularly, that is the most productive phase of Radio Werewolf was 1988 to 1993 when Zena and I co-directed Radio Werewolf and the Werewolf Order. Basically, we got to the point where we decided this cannot be done in nightclubs and concert halls and in the cliches and the apparatus of the rock music world. And we sort of had a spiritual crisis where we realized, speaking for myself, I had to get my own spiritual life back in order. And so there needed to be a period of self-reflection because it was very, you know, doing all these very strenuous public rituals and fighting the media and all of the controversy. It was like, it really was like fighting a war from 1984 mm -hmm. to 1993. It was like a private krieg. And then I needed to reflect on what is my spiritual mm -hmm. direction? What, where is my life going? And so, so then I, d I went into a very serious period of refocusing on meditation and on spiritual mm -hmm. practice. Okay, the albums were mostly meant as ritual. Can you tell us about the conception and the realization? Even today, my method of doing music is not different. My intention is different. My spiritual direction is different. But Radio Werewolf, it was like I was a vessel or a medium for these spiritual forces. And so, for instance, I would say the earlier part of Radio Werewolf, it was literally the devil. I'm removing me and letting the devil speak through me. So I could imagine that you go in a studio, do some mind-setting techniques in the... Well, I was doing a lot of rituals. In, I had a ritual chamber, a locked mm. ritual chamber in my home, and I would communicate with these spiritual forces and be... It was almost like being decessant. And then I would get whatever inspiration, the lyrics, the songs, and working with other people, of course, many collaborators in Radio Werewolf. It's like bringing the spiritual message into this world through music. All of it came about very spontaneously or, and or organically. But it was not uh, separated in that way. You had your part in your ritual chamber where you received... The messages and then you went to the studio and just yes said, Let's it, do it, it, it was way. just it oh. was just like that yes okay. but there was very at that point there was no separation between my private life mm -hmm. and my public life because I was doing these rituals publicly yeah. the other way was to say uh, let's get there plug in everything and then start with a ritual and just record no everything it was it happens. was it was actually radio werewolf was done in a very disciplined way oh. it was never done in any kind of rock and roll oh. way in a way, we were an anti-rock band. We were in the music world, but the way we were doing it was completely like a military operation, putting up posters every... It was like a political campaign every time we did a performance, and it was a very controlled, disciplined, theatrical ritual. But to this day, my music comes from inspiration. It doesn't come from planning or conceiving. You get a vision, you actually... You know, I hear a sound, lyrics come to me, 
and then I try to capture that as purely as I can and communicate it directly without mm -hmm. the menschliche mittel. What was the reason uh, for the release of the vinyl solution? Many people wanted to get the very rare limited releases of the vinyl album so we finally thought that we should release it in a in a coherent form so that people could see them and see how all those concepts worked together. For even this week people have contacted me about re-releasing the Radio Werewolf albums so probably that whole series of albums and and uh, CDs will come out in a new version. Part three, the writings. So before we come to your actual music project, mm -hmm. uh, we just switch to the writer. Sure. You have two main works, the Manson Files and the Demons of the Flesh. In a way, all of them have been very well received. The Satanic Scream actually probably was the most mainstream book mm -hmm. I've ever written. For some reason, it was very widely accessible and put in libraries and taught in film school and, you know, was very widely reviewed. Is so this also a bit of spiritual component? Every, everything I've done has a deeper level mm -hmm. to it, which has a, is a magical intention. What the book or the record is, is just like a ram, a framing device mm -hmm. for the magical intention. So, yeah, but actually all of my books, you know, have been very well received. But I would say definitely the, the Manson File and Demons of the Flesh, Complete Guide, to Left Hand Path Sex Magic, which I co-authored with Zena, and she is writing a new introduction for that book now. There will be a new edition of that because it's become an impossibly rare collector's okay. item, as you know. But those two books definitely became a phenomenon. So this uh, Manson file is very hotly discussed in, in the interviews on your site, especially lately. I like this uh, interview with the Latate Bianca station. And yes, he really knew the subject. Mm -hmm. And I, these days I just refuse to talk to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. Why do you think this uh, case, the Manson file, is still so actual or still moving people after all these years? On a certain level, it's just because for some reason it's become a myth. A legend, and uh, like in a, in the sense of Carl Jung's ideas of an archetype, it almost has a life of its own. This myth and legend has become something much bigger than the case, or the human beings involved in the case, because it touches on on some deeper issues of spirituality. I think, and and also I th I think one uh, aspect of it that is not understood is because so much of it had to do with psychedelic drugs. The Manson murders actually changed the way that psychedelic drugs were perceived. They went from being thought of as a positive force of liberation to suddenly a dangerous, dark, frightening thing that will make you crazy. I think in a very deep way that's part of why it fascinates people so much, because it, it touches on something very deep in human consciousness. Also, it's because I think people sense that the full truth was not told. They are not zufrieden. And that's what my new version of the Manson file finally tells the true story of what these murders were about, which is completely different than the myth of Helter Skelter that was understood. So part of it is I think people have a, an impression that there's, they have been lied to, that something is not true, so they keep returning to it to understand it. What role did Manson lay exactly in the murders? I think he wasn't even in the place. Well, yeah, that's a very complicated thing, but to put it as simply as possible, the murders, every single one of these Manson crimes, they all had to do with the fact that various groups of people in the hippie world were dealing drugs on a massive level and when you're dealing drugs and they're illegal it becomes something you need to have weapons and it becomes a crime so every single one of the manson crimes which you can look up on the internet so i won't elucidate all of them was basically a drug deal that went badly it had nothing to do with any kind of a cult thing nothing to do with race war these may have been ideas that manson and his commune talked about But the crimes themselves were just people selling drugs, being high, the situation getting out of hand, and people being killed. And the Sharon Tate murders, which are the most famous, the reason for the grotesque nature of how it looked like a ritual killing is because the murderer, Tex Watson, 
and the women who killed with him tried to disguise the crime scene to make it look like some crazy ritual killing to disguise the fact that it was just a drug deal gone wrong, like happens all the time. There were so many powerful people involved and the mafia as yourself. Yes, yes, and the, the reason for the cover-up is because, especially with the Sharon Tate murder at the home of Roman Polanski, is were the case to really be looked into properly and examined in court, it would have destroyed many very wealthy and popular Hollywood actors and rock musicians' careers. And that's why it was covered up. So Manson's role was mostly to bring these people together. Manson was part of the crime. It's just that he was not the guru mastermind. He, as I have said clearly, Manson was guilty of... He knew that those murders happened. They came back after murdering those people, some of them, to the Spahn Ranch where Manson was and told him, we've, they were panicking, okay, it, it all went terrible, we killed these people, and he, they said, what should we do? Because he was older, he had been a knaki, and he was a little more experienced with this. So he is a, what we call in English, guilty by association with the crime because he knew about it, And he went back to the house and helped them cover up and help them remove the fingerprints and get rid of the evidence. So he's guilty in that way, but he did not order the murders. And it was never a part of any satanic... It's, there was absolutely nothing satanic, occult, political. It was simply people that knew each other. They were not strangers. They were invited, come by at midnight and we'll sell you some drugs. They came by to rob the drugs and it turned into a fight, and the people who did the killing, Tex Watson, were on methadrine, so they were out of their minds on drugs. It got out of hand, it turned into a violent confrontation, and then, of course, everybody had to be killed because it was Zeugnisse. Do you see a chance that Manson will be set free someday? Never, no, 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 because the myth and the legend of him being the most evil person in the world makes it impossible for the authorities to ever let him free. And also, I have, in speaking to him, I'm not sure that he wants to be free. I, I'm not necessarily convinced that he wants to be. Yeah, I can imagine that. What, what shall he do after all these years in he prison? He has said, saying, where, where will I go? If he left prison, someone would want to kill him immediately because he's considered the most evil person in the world. And he's lived in prison for 60 years of his life, which is incredible. But it's strange. This California had no death penalty, yeah? Well, it had a death penalty. He was sentenced to death, mm. and in 1972, it was reversed, and they got rid of the death penalty. Now they have it again, but they cannot retroactively go back and kill so people. So wouldn't it be easier, easier for the government just to uh, kill him? Yes, it would have been. That was the original plan. Make this big cover-up, helter-skelter, then kill them. But it didn't happen. And he ha even though he himself speaks about it in a very enigmatic way, too much of the truth has come out now. So let's get to Demons of the Flesh. It's a complete guide to left-hand path sex magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sexual thing is a very personal thing to teach people sexual practices or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how does it work? Well, sex magic can be done fairly easily. The most powerful force, one of the most powerful forces, is sex. And I have to make it clear, it's between a man and a woman, two forces come together to create. Those are the forces that create life. So the same force that, that can create life, you can use in your mind to change reality. So sexuality and the power of the orgasm and sexual desire is such a powerful macht in this world that if you apply it magically rather than biologically, The same thing that creates a baby or a new life can change reality if you channel that sexual power into your mind. Sexual magic is relatively easy to do. If you focus your mind on a particular attention during orgasm, that is the most simple form. And, and orgasm is an alteration of consciousness. It's a very powerful moment in which your consciousness changes and you are connected to the cosmos. So if you can discipline your mind to focus on a particular wish 
or agaveness at the moment of orgasm, and if you can get two people to do that at the same time, it's very likely that you will get a result. That's sexual magic. Then se using sex, though, for liberation, for mystical experience, to actually free yourself from the human condition, that is on a whole other niveau, and that is extremely difficult. And that, take, that requires years of meditation, yoga, understanding the energies of the body and the mind, and actually then it becomes something very different than normal human sex. It's basically using sex as a form of meditation and yoga, using the sexual energies between man and woman, and it requires a great deal of trust and a total lack of the games that occur in human relationships. What's the special left-hand path? Well, the left-hand path is, is one of the most misunderstood and, and abused phrases in esoteric terminology. Unfortunately, in Western occultism, the left-hand path has falsely come to mean the way of evil, the black magic of um, selfishness, of individual egocentric manipulation. And that is not the true meaning of the left-hand path. But people like Madame Blavatsky of Theosophy, Aleister Crowley, Anton LaVey, all of these pop culture occultists perverted the true meaning of the left-hand path into almost the opposite of what it is. The true left-hand path comes from the Indian mystical tradition of Tantric Hinduism and Tantric Buddhism, Basically, our body, there's the right hand and the left hand. The left side of the body is the female energy. The right hand is the male energy. So if you are on the left-hand path, you are worshiping or revering the feminine principle, which is the principle of Weisheit or wisdom. The left-hand path is not Satanism. It is not Schwarzmagi. It's actually the the worship of the feminine principle as the source of wisdom. This were the two main writings. Are there new writings planned? You said there will be a re-release of this book. There will, yeah, Sina is doing a new introduction to Demons of the Flesh. As far as my own writings, I have been working on my autobiography, which my French publisher commissioned me to do. It's taking me much longer to complete because it was much more of a challenge to do than I thought it would be, but I think it will be very illuminating. And I've written a long series of novels called The Dallas Book of the Dead, and uh, I did a preview for that. You can hear it on my YouTube channel for National Public Radio in Berlin, and that is set in the early 60s. It's about the CIA, psychedelic research, the Kennedy assassination. Those are, those are the next two literary projects. But for now, I've, I've done a great deal of writing in the past decade, and now I am concentrating again almost completely on music. That's where we are. Part four, Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah. Your actual project, Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah. I've heard only this one song. Mm -hmm. Do you have a produced video? The Ballad of Lurleen Tyler. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Looked like a TV preacher show. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a parody of the kind of right-wing TV preachers that have been my thorn in my side. So it's like taking on the persona of, mm -hmm. of this very American Baptist business Christianity. Is this the new direction? No, not at all. The uh, Kingdom of Heaven is a very eclectic project. There we are us we are using traditional gospel music to tell a narrative, and every Kingdom of Heaven song is completely different. So that's Yeah, maybe, I think whatever the first song would be, people would have the impression, is that the Richtung? But that's only one bestimmt song, so it is a very wide scope of what James Collard and I are doing with Kingdom of Heaven. And, and you can also hear on my YouTube channel, there is the American radio premiere of two other Kingdom of Heaven songs um, in Dreamland, which is about a UFO visitation, and that has an almost science fiction feel. And then another song called Midnight in Cairo, which is a sort of Egyptian 
Arabic stimmung. So we have a very wide and eclectic uh, range that's, of musical styles. So when can we expect the album? I'm hoping that by the end of the year we will have the album completed and produced and ready to go. You already have an, a label for that? No, we are still negotiating. Because for Kingdom of Heaven is a very ambitious project that will require very well-financed touring. So you, it's, you will play live yeah, with it? Yeah. yeah, it's very much going to be a live phenomenon. What other plans you have? Well, Kingdom of Heaven is a specific band project that James Collard and I are collaborating on. And then my solo work is much more in an avant-garde direction. And the first manifestation of this new solo work is my work with John Murphy in Dresden in this concert that's coming up. What can we expect from that ritual? When, it, when I say that it's a sonic ritual, it is a musical concert. It, it's not going to seem like a ritual to most people, although I will be in a certain state of consciousness and I will be evoking, in this sense, the goddess, the female deity. I will be the transmitting force for the female goddess. And that is at the center of the left-hand path experience. But what it is, is a homage or a tribute to the muse, which is what ultimately inspires music, art, getting back to the, to the feminine principle. The, the concert begins with a musical version of Goethe's famous Das ewig weibliche sieht uns hinan. That's what the heart of what this music is. And I would say it's not any kind of genre It truly doesn't fit into any kind of category. Each of the new songs I've composed that will be performed for the first time exclusively at this Dresden concert on September 27th at the Tower Transmissions Festival, they have to be experienced to be understood. They're meant to be experienced in a live setting. It's important that the singer and the audience are working together to make the experience happen. I think this uh, female energy, something industrial scene really needs. Desperately needs. Desperately and and now I don't consider myself, and I never have, to be part of any scene. Though I'm often I'm seen to be part of it, I never have felt at home in Zuhausa with all of that. And yes, this concert is particularly against this whole very male, rigid, masculine, macho energy. I think that really has limited the whole avant-garde scene in Europe and America. By me being a male, incarnating the female energy, I'm definitely making a very specific magical intention to bring the creativity and the flexibility and the freedom and the power that feminine creativity brings into art. It's very much a statement against sexism, against misogyny, against the feraktum, of women that I see in this scene very heavily. And so, I think nobody has really spoken up against it or even voiced it. So I'm looking forward for this concert and I'm very thankful to you that you took the time to mm -hmm. make this interview. It was my pleasure and I appreciate your intelligent and thoughtful questions and I don't give many interviews but you know I appreciate the sensitivity with which you asked your questions. So thank, thank you. you for your time.